Welcome to a Sunday morning inspiration. My name is Savia Sachi Das. I am your host today. And uh, we're very, very happy to welcome His Grace Chaitanya Charan Prabhu to give us a second part of this wonderful discussion on sharing Krishna's message to a Western audience. So what I'll do, I'll just introduce His Grace Chaitanya Charan Prabhu by reading his bio. And then we will have some house rules and we'll hand over to Prabhu to speak. His Grace Chaitanya Charan Prabhu is a monk, mentor, and spiritual author. Seeing the current problems of stress, depression, addiction, and overall misdirection, he felt inspired to dedicate his life to the cause of sharing spiritual wisdom. He travels all over the world from Australia to America, giving talks on spiritual subjects in universities such as Princeton, Harvard, Stanford, and Cambridge, and companies such as Intel, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft. He's a prolific writer. He's the author of the world's only Gita daily feature, wherein he writes daily a 300-word inspirational reflection on a verse from the Bhagavad Gita. Up till now, he has written over 4,000 Gita meditations that are posted on his website, gitadaily.com. His articles have been published in many Indian national newspapers, including Indian Express, Economic Times, and Times of India. If all of this is not enough, he is also an author of 25 books, and I'm sure he's working on some currently, some more. So before we begin, just to let you all know that if you kindly switch your videos on, keep your cameras on, this will improve the mood of the program, make it more personable. Uh, all the mics will be muted until about 10.45 South African time, when we will open for questions and answers. Uh, feel free to write your comments and questions in the chat box. Also, welcome to those who are watching the stream on Facebook. Also, you can type your questions there and uh, we will pick them up from Facebook and pose them to Prabhu when the time comes. So thank you very much, dear devotees, for coming and thank you very, very much, Chitan Chan Prabhu, for spending your time with us. Please, uh, the floor is yours, Hare Krishna. Or probably we will maybe unmute you. And just one small thing before Prabhu starts. I'm sure you noticed we had the same poster from last time and the, the dates and everything. We've been in a power cut for the last week. And so we couldn't really use any machines to do much. And by Krishna's grace, we're back just almost oh. last night to be able to do oh. the program. The power cut was because of oh, it is a storm or something. Power cut. Oh, sorry. Okay. Home of Gyan, Timirandasya, Gyanan, Judishalakaya, Chakshurun, Militam Yena, Tasmai Shri Gurave, Namaha. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prishtaya, Bhutale. Shrimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Itinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschat Yadesha Tarine Vancha Kalpataru Bhescha Kripa Sindhu Bhya Evacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Gadadhara, Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna. I'm grateful to be here with all of you today. And before I start, I would like to know, Say, how many of you were there for the previous session? 
or you heard the previous session because this is a series which i have suggested that we takes so those of you who can from your <clears throat> zoom you can raise your hand so that i know how much how many of you were there last time and how many of you are okay so yes true so okay so two of you so is achi bro and sanand bro you are there both of you are there so now so is achi bro so how should i do this should i take a quick recap of last week's concepts and then take it forward or should i uh, start the topic which i was planning as a build up based on last week's session because it seems most of the participants are different so that is a, some factor we need to consider i think prabhu you can uh, start with your topic and then uh, uh built from there yeah okay and we can refer to the devotees to the page where the class is posted if to catch up with last week's session okay right thank you so so last time so basically i discussed in my own with my small understanding of what it means to share krishna's message with various audiences and the first theme i mentioned was the need to respect people where they are so we had this very important quote of shri prabhupad where he talks about how because some people may be educated they have some wealth or fame or ability they will be sometimes little puffed up but that is all right they deserve it so prabhupad is talking about respecting people where they are and prabhupad says not that we have to teach them but we have to learn the art of how to approach such higher class of men and attract them so we have to learn the art not that simply we have a message and we teach it yes that is true but we have to learn the art of how to approach them and then this requires tact not just purity prabhupad says requires tact and we should meet all challenges and then he says we should follow krishna and uh, lord chaitanya and then the key point here is that being to- tolerant of others and what does tolerant means appreciating their points of view so not just dismissing them that this is that we, we know the truth and everything that you have is false so just give up all your nonsense and take up bhakti that they they are their points of view also need to be appreciated as a letter to balwant uh, and then in that connection i talk also about how you know we need uh, on aspect of krishna consciousness is seeing how god acts in everyone's life what god is doing in their lives and what they are doing or not doing in relationship with god we often focus on this this person is eating meat this person is doing this activity is engaged in unrestricted unrestrained sexual activity this person is doing that that we focus on that but what is god doing in their lives how is god is still there in their hearts as the paramatma as a super soul and he's still acting so we see that and then we analyze this quote quite a bit and then especially i talked about how tradition and contemporary audience uh, tradition and contemporary world is cre- connected so the tradition the living tradition connects with the past through faithfulness through fidelity and it connects with the contemporary audience through flexibility or resourcefulness so so we need both faithfulness and resourcefulness fidelity and flexibility so if there's so those who focus only on fidelity without flexibility they are to some extent the liberals so they are the conservatives and if there's only conservatives then there's no connection with the contemporary world and then the then the tradition becomes like a museum exhibit nobody is practicing in it in real life in contrast if there's flexibility without fidelity then it becomes a fashion trend it just becomes a part of the contemporary world so that's if there's only liberals or only conservatives the tradition is lost so there is a pendulum in between when there's a balance of fidelity and flexibility when there is a when there is a meet there is a honest discussion between conservatives and liberals then the tradition can be continued on then we discuss about examples of innovations in previous traditions in in our tradition in previous times so i'm not going over everything but i'm just talking about the important points which which i'll be building on today so we talked about is the dress non negotiable and adjustment is not compromise it is compassion krishna talks about this in the 12th chapter of the bhagavad gita and krishna's inclusive mood is there in the gita that he is saying that from your place at your pace access my grace and then we talked about our spiritual center so sachi bro did i discuss this part 
about how we may approach spirituality from different perspectives the cultural yes, the, yeah i did yes. this for yeah and then, uh, okay so this was the point i think i should just stop mm. uh, i think did i mention this pre pre modern post modern also little bit no, no we didn't get yeah yes okay so this is so basically the point so two things i talked about till now if you look at this one is that that being compassionate and reaching people where they are at understand appreciating their points of view this is very much a part of our tradition so now if you want to understand where people are at today so to some extent we need to understand the contemporary mind so we could say broadly in history in recent modern history there were three epochs three historical phases and each of them has its own ethos so in the pre modern times people had faith in scripture so whether it was uh, whether it is the bible in europe whether it is the vedas in india whether it is the quran in the middle east or every particular uh, tradition every particular part of the world has its own what would we consider as sacred texts so now that is the pre modern times where people largely believed in god believed in some higher reality believed in some revelations that came from that higher reality and they tried to mold their life accordingly then a significant bridge not a bridge but breach a breach is a break between the pre modern and the modern is not just the presence of technology and things like that but it's faith in science where the source of authority the source of authority in our knowledge was not scripture but science now this conflict played out i think at the right at the dawn of the age of science when there was the conflict between copernic between copernicus and then galileo and uh, between galileo especially and uh, the catholic church about whether the earth moves around the sun or the sun moves around the earth but since then overall it is science which earned people's faith so now while modernity is still coming in some parts of the world so for example in india it's a uh, <clears throat> the cities the major cities have gone beyond modernity to post modernity i'll explain what it is most most of india the towns and others are coming toward modernization and many of the villages are still in the pre modern so i presume something similar might be there in in africa also so what is the post modern idea see the modern idea was that science is the source of all good that by science we will bring through by science by technology we will improve a lot of humanity and it said the promise was we will bring paradise on the earth we will make life so comfortable why do we need any religious paradise but as time passed more and more people started realizing that science is not the source of unadulterated good the second world war and especially toward the end the, the dropping of the uh, <clears throat> atom bomb on hiroshima and nagasaki that was uh, that was a movement that brought this very strongly into the modern human psyche that science can science can now science is not the cause but science can lead to immense destruction through technology so now even now people are very much enamored by technology and everybody looking say for the latest smartphone latest gadgets but still people don't think that science alone is going to solve our, our problems so in the pandemic we are naturally looking for uh, looking for vaccines or cures or preventive measures but at the same time we recognize that maybe it is science which is a part of the problem maybe there was a lab leak which caused the pandemic and maybe it is the political or the managerial administrative uh, over oversights or neglects by people which led to the pandemic so the idea is that people people recognize that science is important technology is important but that is not that unquestioning faith also this is the post modern ethos post modern ethos is you don't accept scripture as authority don't accept science as authority but expect accept experience as authority experience means if something works for me if something feels good for me if something does good to me in my life then that's when i will accept it otherwise i will not accept it so 
a typical example of say the post modern ethos would be that or let, let's consider how the authority would work in pre modern modern and post modern times so so for example if say somebody is i was at an interfaith conference in america uh, in washington dc and i had some interesting experiences so we're talking about how to reach out to post modern audiences that was a topic so one christian pastor made the point that you know in the past say if a if a pastor was offering some marriage counseling and he told couples you know that divorce is a sin against god and if you divorce, if you separate then you will not be saved you will not be delivered you will not go to heaven it's a it's a sin then oh we cannot do this hmm? if you so if if a pastor said if you if in today's world if the pastor says that you know if you if you separate if you if you, if you break your family you separate you will go to hell people will tell them that you go to hell we have no interest in hearing from a person like you on the other hand is that same pastor he says that you no know, he comes with us maybe he is a married pastor and he says you know i and my wife we have been married together for 25 years and we would like to share with you now the how the wisdom from the bible helped us to stay together to make this relationship work oh yeah and then people are interested so if we just say that this is what the bible says that's not interested but how we made it work this is our experience so that is important that is what persuades people in today's world and that brings us understanding the ethos will also lead to the approach so when you do outreach there could be broadly three ways of doing outreach as prescriptive normative and descriptive so prescriptive is like a doctor giving prescription do this and don't do this and yes now there are in the in in the bible there is this thou shall not and thou shall so there are commandments so the one way is prescriptive outreach the other is normative that okay that these are this is the right way to live this is the wrong way to live these are the norms which we need to follow but the descriptive is that this is what i do and this is why i do it so yes we may we say that this is taught in scripture but that is not the thrust why see somehow a significant difference between say pre modern and post modern is in the pre modern times if somebody quoted scripture that would give them a lot of authority oh what you are speaking is not just your wisdom it is based on scripture but in the post modern times if a person quotes too much scripture you think can't you think for yourself are you just going to repeat your party party line you know i don't want just a mouthpiece i want a real person tell me what you have experienced so the values can be radically different so what happens is descriptive means how does it work for me this is what i do and this is why i do it so in general the modern mindset or the post modern mindset is where the descriptive approach works the most and prescriptive and normative it just alienates people because is prescriptive who are you to tell me one of the main characters of post modernism is that there is a systematic questioning and erosion of authority authority figures so in broadly you could say in the pre modern even modern times if somebody is an authority figure then the presumption is this person must have some experience some expertise so let me listen to them and if they say something questionable i'll doubt them but by default there is some respect for authority now we are talking especially in religious and spiritual circles but in circles in general in various circles also so broadly in the pre modern and modern time there is respect for authority and if the authority acts in a questionable way or doesn't do right things the, uh, then maybe the authority is question maybe doubt is there but in the post modern attitude anybody who is in authority position is by default considered worthy of suspicion now oh, that you must have done something unscrupulous to grab power and you are here just to lord over others so you could say there is a default suspicion of authority and then you have to actually earn trust and this translates also towards a suspicion of 
institutionalized religion if somebody is a official leader in a institutionalized religion then they think oh you are just a part of a system that controls people so what happens is even today in the post in the postmodern ethos people are interested in spiritual teachers but they are not interested in religious heads so their idea of religious head is there's a power structure and you are at the top of the power structure but their idea of spirituality is uh, that they you are okay you are open minded you are thoughtful you have experience higher things you have some meaning and purpose in life i want to learn that so i'll talk a, so i'll talk a little bit more about this later but such people in the postmodern ethos people want to be spiritual but not religious want to be spiritual but not religious now their idea of spirituality is i want to be open minded i want to explore i want to learn i want to grow i want to find meaning and their idea of religious is you know you have to follow or believe certain dogmas you have to do certain rituals and that they are not interested in so to some extent our traditional approach in outreach has been prescriptive and normative prescriptive and normative so for example if you talk about chanting now we can quote oh in all in these 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 scriptures the holy name chanting of the holy uh, maha mantra is being talked about and therefore we should chant that is that would be normative that would be prescriptive but what will work okay you know there are so many books across different traditions why should i care for your book but if you tell them you know okay you know, i had all these cravings earlier i was very short tempered and since i started doing this mantra chanting i found my anger has gone away my cravings have decreased my have become so much calmer and that's why nobody is forcing me to do this but i do it because you know, i feel so connected i feel so composed that's why i want to do this so that's descriptive so this is what works in today's world now there isn't mean prescriptive and normative are not important they are, they also have their place but we need to know to which audience how to speak so first of all is the audience have have how does the audience see us do they see us as a person who has some knowledge that they treat as an authority or they treating us just as okay you have your idea my, i have my idea then maybe we have to we have to by our words by our actions earn, earn their respect and one of the best ways to earn respect is is not by being prescriptive or normative but by being descriptive so quite often the descriptive way of outreach is associated with being authentic you know people want to be people want somebody authentic authentic means actually what you are saying you are not just repeating the party line you have lived it you have learned it and now you have you are sharing it with me if you are doing that then i am very interested in it so this is with respect to the broad ethos so before i go to the next point now i would like i mean since this is more of a sharing kind of discussion so i would like to know from your experience uh, the typical audience in africa where do you feel they are at are is are the audience that you connect with are they at a post modern level modern level or pre modern level or any other point that you would like to reflect on on what i have discussed then i can take this forward from there okay there's one comment here no oh, this is okay shardira samadhi yes i'm happy to be of service but sabesh ji prabhu so what, what you have anything to say about this yes i would say it's uh, it really makes it very clear the, the categories and what you're finding is that if it go more to rural areas are found is that they want to find out if you believe in god and then they say oh you are a priest they may not know our church or you know our religion is christ as hari krishnas but as soon as they hear that you are religious you are a priest they are willing to hear you in the cities in the universities um they are interested mainly in you they want to know your life what you've been through and by a relationship with you then you know slowly they are willing to accept the knowledge that you live by but generally they they want descriptive and then that prescriptive and oh okay so that so in one sense the same as in i would say in india also 
in the rural areas there is definitely piety is there and people respect if somebody is from a is is from a spiritual background but beyond that in the cities it's very different thank you sajaji bro would you else like to share something any comments reflections questions yes shadi arasma ta ji hi krishna prabhu thank you for coming back and continuing this very enlivening seminar so one reflection that i had is when i was involved at university outreach i mean i didn't kind of um i didn't have this concept as well crystallized as you have now presented it but i kind of also picked up that the students didn't appreciate when we presented krishna consciousness as like the ultimate and so or the absolute truth so i remember having a conversation with the other devotees and saying that i think that the students accepted better if we just said this is a view of you know of life and this is a way to live you know just kind of presented as an option but then there was a lot of resistance because the devotee said that's not how prabhupad represents it like prabhupad is very like you know like this is it so i was just wondering how you if you can say something about that tension we often experience where where people emphasize that prabhupad was very direct and then saying that if we you know present what you classified as like the more uh was it normative approach where you know that is then seen as a deviation approach. descriptive approach yeah yeah descriptive like because I've, i've often encountered like people saying to me if i say let's do descriptive then people tell me that that is a deviation okay that's a good point now i would say three things about this uh, first is that uh, if we are presenting things in a descriptive way isn't that a deviation from prabhupada's presentation a normative or <clears throat> prescriptive well we have to see where prabhupada is presenting things if we read the book easy journey to other planets that is the first book that prabhupada wrote and that book is dedicated to the scientists of the world and the tone in that book is very different from say what you might say see find in life comes from life or other books where prabhupada seems to be critiquing science and scientists quite strongly and in that book prabhupada is saying we would like to present for our for the scientists of the world to reflect on this so prabhupada had different moods at different times and oh, that's first thing uh, so continuing that i i have talked with uh, several of shri prabhupada senior disciples who were doing college outreach in america during prabhupada's times and at least two of them have personally confirmed this i have asked them to send me the letters but they said that prabhupada personally told us this that the worst thing that you can do in your college outreach is present krishna consciousness as a set of do's and don'ts says nobody likes rules says prabhupada said present krishna consciousness as a philosophy as a world view and now the prabhupada wouldn't so much appreciate as a view but that the point is this is a world view so help people rather than saying you know this is the reality what we do is we help them that this world view let's see how it helps you make sense of reality so that, that there's a slight but significant difference in the two in the two this, instead of saying this is the truth we don't say this is not the truth but we say okay whatever you are experiencing whatever your life is see this world this world view can help you make sense of it so you know the jigsaw puzzles why do bad things happen to good people or you know, why why are we uh, why are we not satisfied even when we gain the things that we long for now, what will bring meaning true meaning and fulfillment in our life so there are fundamental questions that are universal and they're answered so if we present it as a as a resource to people for making sense of their own experiences for placing their own life in a broader framework then that is very powerful so now there is a there's a slight difference between being descriptive and being uh, relativistic so relativism means that now there are two different things between i have my view and you have your view hmm? that is everybody is a individual free person and we can't control people's views 
we are not thought police we can't uh, determine or control what people are going to think so everybody will have their view but are we saying that your view is the ultimate reality we are not saying that what we are saying is this is my understanding and we don't have to present initially that this is the ultimate reality prabhupad himself did he do that prabhupad didn't introduce krishna or lord chaitanya during his western outreach till quite late prabhupad just introduced the hari krishna maha mantra introduced prasad and he talked about our non material identity and even that non material identity people didn't understand much so any education is progressive we don't present say for a kindergarten student of math we don't present them triple integral calculus that will come later so so that this is the ultimate reality that this is uh, the truth coming from the revealed scriptures the vedas if that is going to help people develop faith then that is favorable we present it if that is not going to help people develop faith then then why present it so i would say prabhupada was very resourceful that means what would help people come closer to krishna he would do that so uh, then going back to the point of authority once uh, now when in the temple when a speaker comes and speaks we have a we have a vyasasan for the speaker speaker sits on a quite an elegant seat so once during a college program in an america i believe it was in europe not america it was europe in france or something the devotees had arranged a big seat for prabhupad on a stage and the students started jeering and mocking that you know why do you need to sit on such a high seat and prabhupad was so annoyed with this you know the seat is not important i can sit on the floor i just want to talk with you and then after that prabhupad told the organizers whenever you organize college programs there is no need for such a seat so if certain external forms of respect are are doing disservice then we don't have to necessarily present them so the it is certainly we want to be faithful to prabhupad but what is faithful to prabhupad mean it means that we fulfill the purpose of prabhupad and prabhupad's purpose was to help people come closer to krishna to help people raise their consciousness so now which which particular way of presenting we do whether the speaker sits on the vyasasan or not in a college program or something like a vyasasan that's irrelevant if the message of krishna consciousness is going to the college audience that's excellent so i would say that we again have to differentiate between what is essential and what is contextual so prabhupada will also talk about principles and details so the mode of approach is something which is uh, which is uh, the way we present i think that's something which is uh, which is uh, to be understood that it will be different at different times so prabhupad when he was in america in the early days he stayed at the mishra yoga studio and he stayed at the mishra yoga studio there was this dr mishra he was a yoga teacher and he was he was a proponent of the philosophy of impersonalism and prabhupad and he would often have quite uh, quite vibrant arguments vigorous arguments and many years later after the krishna consciousness movement had spread he came to meet prabhupad and then giriraj maharaj was there at that time and he saw they had a very cordial discussion and then uh, prabhupad said Prabh, he asked prabhupad wasn't he isn't he an impersonalist and prabhupad said yes so prabhupad then added something see philosophically we argue like anything but culturally we are friends so this is an amazing point prabhupad was able to differentiate between the two it's not that just because i sit and talk with you nicely that doesn't mean i agree with your philosophy just because just but just because i disagree with your philosophy doesn't mean that i don't treat you like a human being that i don't act in a cultured way with you so prabhupad is saying that there is philosophy and there is culture so even the philosophical differences are there the culture still has to be maintained so this is a good example of a difference between what is central and what is not central so when a person has just come for a, like a courtesy visit or just a friendly visit at that time we don't have to load on them with that their philosophy is wrong to be polite be cultured with them so we have to consider in each interaction that we have with someone what can i do to raise this person's consciousness so 
if that is by quoting scripture and speaking in a prescriptive way that is great if it is quoting experience and speaking in a descript descriptive way that's also great so this is where we have to faithfulness to prabhupad is not just doing what prabhupad did but it is fulfilling the purpose that prabhupad wanted to be fulfilled does it address the question okay any other comments or questions so now i would like to give some examples of uh, okay yeah okay yes yes Chato, yeah, please. You have the floor, Chato. We cannot hear you. I think we can't hear you. Maybe can you Chato, your connection is not good. We'll maybe pause for now and give Snazo a call while you sort yourself out. Uh, my question Me is about time. Okay, thank you. Okay. Engagement to, and about and the social science and the natural science and the social. Okay, so Snazo, Prabhu, we'll tell off the call. Yeah, Snazo. You yeah, so I read. Yeah, I I read the question. So yes, now you were asking that how do we deal with devotees who disagree with the approach we choose to take? Yes, that's. I think the world is big enough for devotees with different approaches to do outreach. I mean, we're not going to do it in the same program. Maybe they we go to different colleges or have different programs. It's not that Prabhupada didn't. Speak in the normative way or the prescript, uh, prescriptive way, but that's not the only way he spoke. So, if some devotees feel convinced that you know, that's the way to do, then we don't have to we don't have to make it our mission to oppose them. But at the same time, if we, based on our understanding, our consultation of senior devotees, and our experience, f f have decided, have inferred that a particular approach works best, then we can work with that approach. So. there are certain core truths to krishna consciousness which uh, we we cannot uh, or on which we cannot have disagreement if somebody says actually you are not the soul you are the body well that is a core principle that our core essential identity is spiritual somebody says you know actually you know krishna is just a conception there is no such thing as god well, then obviously that person can't be krishna conscious but apart from those core truths there are many other things over which there can be diversity of opinion and according to the diversity of opinion devotees can function in different ways so i think it's important that there be space for different approaches and it's not that we are saying that the prescriptive approach is the only right approach we are ready to learn so if tomorrow it is uh, no sorry the descriptive approach is the only right approach for today's audiences maybe it is that even in today's world it's not that everybody is post modern maybe in some part, some people might still up, uh, like a pre modern approach when i do some college outreach i i ask uh, in, in india you know, what attracts people i ask students what attracted people so they at least till 10 15 years ago several students would tell me and these are students in some of the top colleges in india they would say that krishna consciousness made my life so easy that i just got a set of you know, this is what i should do this is what i should not do so much of my confusion is gone now my life has become clear for me so i was quite surprised to hear that so these were students who were in the engineering colleges top engineering colleges but still they came from they came from good backgrounds they had a, they had a virtuous religious upbringing and they had learned some things from their parents and in some ways the moral values of krishna consciousness reinforce what they had learned 
So for them, a prescriptive approach was helpful. So I wouldn't say that the prescriptive approach won't work at all, because even today's world, not everybody is postmodern. So the point is that we have to see which approach works for who, and accordingly. If somebody now, it also also depends that that see different devotees who do outreach will also attract different kinds of people. So somebody who has a prescriptive approach will probably attract people who like that prescriptive approach. Mm-hmm. And in future also, they will, they will, if they do outreach, they will also attract people with the prescriptive who have, who need a prescriptive approach. So I think there are different ways in which uh, outreach can be done. So we can have, we can try to create the space for our way of outreach, while giving others the space for their way of outreach. Okay. Thank you. Hmm. Any other comments or questions? Thought of if you want to type, uh, then maybe you can type and we can discuss also. Mm. Okay. So Are now, yeah. Okay. So, so we discussed about the the prescriptive descriptive way of doing things. now there is a as i said there's a difference between <clears throat> being descriptive and being relativistic so relativistic means entirely that you know that you you are you, you have your way i have my way and all these are different ways which are going on well we are not talking that way what we are talking is that ultimately we all want to move in our spiritual life we all want to grow in our spiritual life and for that purpose we have to reach people where they are and raise them upwards uh, i think last time i talked about this uh, the going up the mountain from different paths that various religious traditions are like if you consider the top of the mountain and the bottom of the mountain top of the mountain is spiritual consciousness bottom of the mountain is material consciousness so there are different ways to go up the mountain did i show that diagram and last time discuss that yes prabhu okay good so i will just show that once again but the point i was going to make here is that in general when we do outreach there are broadly two things to be considered that there is um, okay i don't think i discussed this last time so when we talk about consciousness hmm. so there is expansion of consciousness and then there is elevation of consciousness now what do i mean by this initially the consciousness shrunk so you can see the small circle over here it is a very self centered consciousness so my desires my needs my moods it's i i so people with shrunk consciousness are i specialists not i specialists but i specialists you know for they they nars- the poetics and some narcissists so now people with such consciousness they really can't do much in their lives for them the whole universe orbits around them so now from here consciousness can grow in broadly two ways one is what we can call as So here's you. There is expansion of consciousness. So expansion. Now we, I'm using these words in a particular way. I'm talking about expansion means in the horizontal dimension. That means they are thinking of something bigger than themselves. They're thinking, thinking of their family. They're thinking about country. They're thinking about their ethnicity. They're thinking about their community. They're thinking about their race. They're con- thinking about their something bigger than themselves. and this krishna appreciates this is krishna talks about this in 12.8 in the gita sorry 12.11 he says that if you cannot absorb yourself in me then at least think of something bigger than yourself had i shown this last time so is achibro no na okay so yeah so expansion of consciousness means that a person may do some humanitarian work for poor people a person may work very actively for helping others now i was born and brought up in india 
and for many indians going to america is like going to the spiritual world so the purpose and perfection of indians is to go to america get a job over there and and become and earn a lot of money and become well respected so i had a maternal uncle who with after great struggle rising from poverty he went to america and he started his own business is quite successful so he had such enthusiasm to take all his relatives to america all of us and now it was not that he was strict he was really selfless he put in a lot of endeavor going through a lot of legal loopholes because he felt that your life could be better over there now whether the life was better or not that's a different question but the point is he genuinely felt that so he could have gone to america and he could have remained i specialist i am successful i am glorious he wanted to share it with others so he had a great concern for the relatives so that's that's one example of expansion of consciousness not just the immediate family but also the relatives now on the other hand there could be elevation of consciousness now elevation of consciousness means one moves from matter towards spirit one moves towards god now normally we would think of elevation of consciousness as good it's my religion my spiritual path and in one sense this is good but if there is only elevation without exp- expansion that what happens by that is it's narrow minded that means a person thinks yes this is what all that matters and as long as i am going spiritually everybody else let them go to hell i don't care for them they are after all suffering their own karma so this is uh, this a person is going spiritually but they are very narrow minded they are very calculative very sectarian so and what happens is it's my religion and my religion is only religion so although their consciousness is going towards god but it is not really it is not expanded so we may think i am becoming spiritual but what are we doing is we are becoming sectarian and sectarianism is not at all something which is desirable it's intrinsically not desirable but especially in today's world if people are alienated by something they say that uh, that sectarianism just say they are fed up of it in fact we often think about atheism and atheism and that's true but there are increasing number of people who say if you ask them for their religion they say nuns in america and europe nuns i don't follow any religion why it's not that they are actively atheists they are basically apathetic to religion because they say there are enough problems in this world instead of solving those problems you people argue about what is there in the next world and you increase the problems in this world so i don't i don't want anything to do with this so if there is sectarianism in the name of religion then that simply alienates people so now what is ideally required is this both elevation and expansion of consciousness this we can call as evolution of consciousness now when krishna talks about so krishna talks about this evolution of consciousness when he in gita in, for, when he is talking about the devotee those devotees the first character is a devotee he talks about 12 13 he says advaishta sarva bhutana maitra karuna eva cha he says my devotee is the non envious friend of everyone now what is non envious friend of everyone means that if somebody is following some other religious path somebody is having some other belief system and maybe they have more followers maybe they have more influence they have more wealth a devotee is not envious of that a devotee is not trying to pull them down saying that you know you are wrong and i am right a devotee of course try to help them rise to a better understanding but a friend of everyone so okay they are following a particular path maybe by following that path they may not be coming to krishna but maybe by following it they are coming from the modes of passion and ignorance at least to some level of goodness something good is happening in their life appreciate that so the most effective outreach can be done when there is both elevation and expansion of consciousness so for example more and more in today's world there is environmental consciousness people are worried that the way during the because of industrialization we have exploited nature we have disrupted the ecology future generations may not have a habitable earth so now that there may be nothing intrinsically spiritual in what they do what they are talking about their consciousness may not be elevated but their consciousness is definitely expanded and that is good 
like they're thinking of something bigger than themselves so as devotees what we talk about is we want a elevated consciousness but we also want a expanded consciousness so we can see the good in others so if somebody is is having a very shrunk consciousness then what happens is even if they come to krishna consciousness their consciousness may just go upward vertically but their consciousness may not expand and such devotees may become very narrow minded very self very self centered very judgmental and then that's not very advisable because they may not be able to reach out to people they may not be able to appreciate people where they are so we want if people have expanded consciousness say somebody already has is very eco conscious environmental conscious or if somebody is say very much uh, concerned about poverty you know when i was in my college i had great faith in the power of education since my childhood i loved to study and i loved to teach so when i was in my college i started uh, i joined a not welfare, welfare or social welfare organization and i would go to the slums near my college just behind my college and i would try to uh, offer some free tuition classes in english math history some subjects like that to the kids over there and over a period of time we became friends and then i thought that actually i was helping them and i was genuinely wanted to help them but after some time it struck me this the as the kids started opening up i started i came to know that that uh, they their homes were dysfunctional primarily because the parents that's why the fathers were alcoholics and when they would drink and come there would be domestic violence and i saw, as they started telling their stories i started you know i started thinking how much am i really helping them by teaching them something about math or history or who lived when and what they did when their lives are so dysfunctional their homes are so dysfunctional now when i when i talk with their fathers i had the stereotypical idea of an alcoholic as a person who is irresponsible a person who is who is rude and a person who is who is just dysfunctional but i found that many of them were quite courteous friendly they were appreciative that i was coming and teaching their children but then those kids told me that that you know after they drink it's like something changes within them they become like a different person entirely so at that time i started thinking that maybe we should do something to help them come off alcohol so we connected with some experts in that field and uh, our, our organization decided to uh, decided to diversify into helping people detox help uh, to get off alcoholism so we had some experts come and give some talks and we also offered some support and with this it was a small community a small slum uh, and one of my friends was going to a nearby village and there also he managed to swell a small village but he managed to make everybody give up alcohol and it was a big victory for us at that time but then one evening he came back after the after visiting that and he looked crestfallen i asked him what happened he said that there's a local elections for the municipality the local government and one of the politicians in order to woo the voters he came with truck loads of alcohol and gave free alcohol to anybody who would vote for him and not only the fathers but even their kids even their sons had taken alcohol and then that was the time i really started doing some soul searching so it struck me that that yes we are offering external support like we are opening doors for people by offering them education Edu- for the kids it was education in st- academic studies for the parents it was education about about say alcohol awareness and alco- anti alcoholism but i said that I, it struck me very powerfully that we may open doors for people externally but there is something inside people that sabotages them that stops them from walking through those open doors and that is when i started searching to try to understand what is it that can actually transform people and then i read in the bhagavad gita about in the third chapter how there is a inner enemy which can devour us a self destructive desire krishna talks about karma i mean he's talking about karma it's not just lust he's talking about self destructive desire in general so that was a revelation for me and that's when i felt that the most valued knowledge that can be shared for transforming society 
is is actually spiritual knowledge the knowledge of bringing our inner transformation so the idea is that that i i told this for two points that if somebody who already has some zeal somebody has some environmental zeal somebody has some humanitarian zeal and if they understand how krishna consciousness can actually deepen the transformative effects that they are seeking to bring about then if such a person takes up krishna consciousness then they will grow they will not only themselves uh, do a lot but they already have that expanded consciousness they will be able to reach a lot of people and transform a lot of people so in general we need to if somebody has expanded consciousness they might not be thinking of something spiritual but we can't dismiss that we shouldn't dismiss that sometimes we just dismiss humanitarian work this is just mundane well it may be mundane but still the person is thinking of something bigger than themselves and that is valuable so again this brings us to the point that when we are doing outreach appreciate where people are at so if somebody already has expanded consciousness such a person we just add krishna prabhupada in the ishopanishad purport says that whatever is ism somebody is following if they add krishna to it they that ism will become perfect so this this was one important point about expansion of consciousness and elevation of consciousness and understanding this can help us become a little more appreciative of what others are doing and then help them also appreciate krishna consciousness from that perspective so any reflections or questions about this yeah if you have anything uh, you can unmute yourself and uh, speak there was a question that we saw from omkar <laughs> okay uh it's it's okay. says yeah is is krishna west a form of the descriptive approach it is from the previous segment okay is krishna west a form of the descriptive approach well i would say before i answer this question uh first of all you know it's what do we mean by krishna west now krishna west is a particular initiative started by rudayan maharaj and there is something which he is doing and there are a lot of conceptions about what he is doing so i have visited some of his centers and i have talked with maharaj also extensively i have some podcasts with him also where we discuss and personally also talk with him so Mm. descriptive approach is one part of it but there are many other aspects to it also so yes definitely the way of presenting is not very didactic but at the same time i don't think they are comprom- that they, they don't talk about philosophy they do talk about philosophy so i i wouldn't want to equate say one specific initiative within is gone with one particular approach now that descriptive approaches have been used by different people also so when my spiritual master is holy radhanath maharaj wrote the journey home at that time i had already published a few books so one of my senior god brothers gave me maharaj's book before it was published so read it and you know tell maharaj your thoughts about the book so i met maharaj and now that book itself is quite adventurous and the stories are what captivate many people so but maharaj asked me so what do you think about the book maharaj says i told maharaj i love the tone of this book so in this book you are not you are not speaking as a spiritual master on the vyasasan giving a class you know you are as a seeker sharing your what you learned with others maharaj said maharaj nodded and said you know this is exactly the approach you need for reaching out to western audiences it's it's a experience it is journey so that book also has a descriptive approach and it has uh, it has inspired many people 
who would not normally read a read a prescriptive or normative book they read that book and they at least get some appreciation so generally if somebody is writing their life story their memoir that would largely be in a descriptive approach although of course that could also be written in a prescriptive approach so it uh, it depends i would say there are many people who can use different approaches and i said even radhanath maharaj he is giving he is giving a class, bhagavatam class on the vyasasan in a in a temple he is not going to use a descriptive approach so much he may give expose share some experiences some realizations but there is going to go out prabhupada going to quote shastra so i would say that it depends to whom we are speaking in what forum we are speaking and then which approach can be used at that time okay Sagarananda Prabhu. You can unmute yourself. Sagarananda, you have your hand raised. Oh, now they are. Sorry, the admin hadn't allowed us to unmute. Hare Krishna Prabhu, thank you so much for your class. I only caught it uh, about halfway, but I have a question uh, generally about. Um, you were speaking there about Shri Lopal earlier about Shri Lopal Pad and how he dealt on different levels with different people, culturally or spiritually, whatever the case may be. Um, so my question is, you you find sometimes in the West that, um, well, at least the way I've been taught is that. You know, if you go to someone's house, let's say, you, if you maybe haven't, in one way or another, let them know about your cultural or spiritual inclinations, maybe just in, let's say, in regards to food, right? And they prepare you a meal, and and that meal is as a host to a guest. Uh, in, in 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 the way I was brought up, that you you must accept it, even if it's just you know to honor it, so to speak. Because to refuse it is to refuse the host's uh, hospitality, and of course we we we've read in, Shula, uh, in the Lila Amrita where um, once Prabhupada uh, visited, uh, I don't know maybe it was a, a life member's house and they somehow cooked um, onions, uh, and and Sh the, the Shri Prabhupada's servant at the time came to warn Prabhupada, you no, know, there's onions in the food, um, and Shri Prabhupada chastised the the, the devotee. For not having um, given prior notice to the hosts, so my my question generally is: um, if 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 let's say we haven't given these kind of notices and we are let's say visiting people because sometimes you know we were we, people would like us to visit them and try to get them to share Krishna consciousness in their own homes in their own uh, comfortable spaces. And and they also trying to be hospitable by you know catering for people and, and and things like that. How do we deal with those situations where people don't always meet our standard of 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 cultural living in terms of food, dress, whatever the case may be, um, against what we're really there for, which is to preach the essential uh, spiritual knowledge of Krishna consciousness. How do yeah. you balance yeah. those two? Thank you. It's a very important question. So related with this, uh, the same approach of descriptive and pre um, <clears throat> descriptive and prescriptive, there is another way of looking at the same things. Um, so that we could say there are two approaches, or two in which we may envision spirituality ourselves, or we may share with others. Um, but the question is that when we Uh, when we go to somebody's house and we have to share, they offer us some food and we haven't been able to give advance notification, notice, intimation to them. So then, it's courtesy to take whatever they've offered. So then, should we or should we not? So the approach I call is a digital and analog. Digital means this is right and this is wrong. So, on the other hand, analog approaches things are on a spectrum from rightness to wrongness. So. so for example digital means this is like one zero logic one or zero either you are krishna conscious or you are not krishna conscious mm. now there are some aspects about which we can be digital but in my understanding krishna consciousness also 
it's things are analog so it's not one zero if somebody there can be a big spectrum from black to white so what this means is that um, we can see that with respect to food it can be a spectrum we could say the highest level of prasad would be that we not only of one devotee is very one of my friend is very insistent he says that that what is prasad he says it is not food offered to krishna it is food cooked to be offered to krishna so it is only when somebody has cooked in proper consciousness offered to krishna only then it becomes prasad now okay so what do you do if you are traveling and you buy some something from outside and that's the only thing you have to eat is that prasad is not prasad well it's not one zero so you could say that there could be various levels where the something is not only cooked to be offered to krishna then i asked him why not cooked to be offered to krishna why only cooked to be offered to krishna we could say it could be sown to be offered to krishna it could be harvested to be offered to krishna so we have our own farms where, where it is devotee farmers who cultivate them then they send it to maybe devotee households where devotees cook them and offer them so we could have at one level food sown harvested cooked offered honored in krishna consciousness you know in kc all this happens in kc now beyond that there could be there could be just food that is offered to krishna then there could be food which is okay we are, we are in a situation where we can't offer the food to krishna and we take that food in spite of that because that's just the context we offer it in our mind sometimes the food may contain something which we can't take then if it's meat i think it's reasonable enough to tell people that i'm a vegetarian i don't take meat this is my this is what my tradition follows that's okay so my understanding is that there are primary and secondary things in krishna consciousness so in the, i live in a part of india called maharashtra and here there is a huge worship of ganesh ganesh is one of the prominent devtas in the vedic tradition he is, so he is usually worshiped and ganesh puja is a time when the worship of ganesh is and his his a deity of his is invited to the homes and people came in the home for 10 days so it's a time for a lot of socialization so people go to each other's homes people talk with each other people uh, people's hearts and minds are very open at that time and then there is a particular food item which is called as modak which is standard what is offered to ganesh and people distribute to each other so now on those days if somebody goes to that uh, goes to somebody's house and they offer that that particular item now that's that's a sweet but it's not offered to krishna so so should a devotee take it or not now i have talked with many different preachers and they have different opinions about this but one of the most effective one of the most successful one of the devotees who is most one of the devotees who does most successful outreach in rural areas he says that you know if 365 days a year or 364 and two third days a year we are taking normal prasad cooked for krishna and then taking it and one day it's not even one meal it's one morsel of food if we take which is not offered to krishna but by that you know we just by going there when we people greet us they chant hari krishna then we can invite them to our programs and they invite us to they create forums for us to uh, share krishna bhakti at their forums so we have to see the bigger game so now we are not saying every day just go to anywhere and whatever they are offering they eat it but as com- as compared to the benefit of that we are doing by sharing krishna consciousness in those occasions if we are just uh, you know eating some food which is not according to the ideal standard of krishna consciousness i would say that it's not a big loss now of course i say this with caution because I, i said i would say it because different devotees get strength and conviction in their krishna consciousness from different ways so for some devotees you know they feel say if if i don't wake up in the morning at 4 o'clock or 3 o'clock or whatever time it is that they regularly wake up they feel they feel guilty throughout their life they feel I, my spiritual life is completely disoriented i am useless for others it may be if i don't read scripture every day for one hour what am i doing with my life 
for somebody else it may be if i don't worship the deities for somebody else if, if i don't go and speak about krishna encourage people to come to krishna then they feel their life is their valueless so you know we all have certain things which give us strength in krishna consciousness which give us that conviction that yeah i am earnest i am serious i am pursuing i am doing that which is truly valuable so for some devotees that sense that i am serious about my spiritual life comes by the strictness with which they follow certain rules so ekadashi means i am going to fast absolutely and when they do it that way they feel yes i am being serious i am showing my seriousness to krishna so if somebody has that feeling that this is the way i get the conviction that i am serious not that i show the world that i am serious but i myself this is i myself get that conviction then fine then though they don't they don't have to adjust that part but if somebody doesn't have that they don't consider that as a central aspect of their krishna consciousness in a relative hierarchy i would say getting somebody to become favorable to krishna consciousness helping them to appreciate a devotee by being nice and cultured and polite with them that is more important than than occasional um, occasional meal which we might take which might not be exactly according to prasadam standards so i would say that it's it depends a lot on con- both on the context the intent and the nature of the person all of those why a person is doing it what is the way the person themselves think and what is the context in which they are acting does it answer the question yeah. i think it does prabhu uh in the interest of um, time maybe i'll just offer up uh fred's question in the comment section and then prabhu will find a way towards a conclusion uh fred as sari krishna sometimes someone with a shrunk consciousness may come in contact with devotees with some sense of wanting to advance himself how to engage with this person to bring expansion to their consciousness how oh, that's a very important point so how can we help a person with shrunk consciousness who has come to bhakti to expand their consciousness it's generally i would say there's devotional service so devotion is we could say about elevating the consciousness service is about expanding the consciousness devotion is expressed in relationship with krishna the devotion is we we behold the deities we chant the holy names we study scripture so devotion helps elevate the consciousness and service helps expand the consciousness okay you know but that these devotees are working so hard let me assist them when i read prabhupad's lila amrut when i completed that book actually i got up from my chair and i just offered obeisances to prabhupad's picture in that book itself and i said prabhupad you know you worked so hard let me assist you in your mission and that was the time when i started thinking that i should i should become a brahmachari a monk so the idea is that if you just associate with devotees and especially if somebody associates with dedicated devotees then they see these devotees are doing so much they are carrying so much of a burden let me carry some of their burden so i would say that if somebody new has come with shrunk consciousness if somehow they develop some appreciation for some devotee some attraction to some devotee and that appreciation this thing they can develop if the devotee is kind the devotee is nice polite and helpful uh, then what happens is they will want to assist that devotee so and in assisting that devotee their consciousness will expand so i would say service is the way we can help a person with shrunk consciousness to expand their consciousness okay so i think jayatirtha prabhu uh, jayanand prabhu was expert in this you know, when he would jayanand prabhu organize rath yatras then almost anyone and everyone he would just so friendly with them that just where he would go people would come and people he was engaged them why don't you do this why don't you do this and not only would they come and do it they would all feel a sense of ownership with the festival you know this is our festival we played a part in it so in many ways 
for people to elevate their consciousness it requires effort so sitting down and chanting the holy names kirtans are nice but japa is quite difficult even hearing philosophy not everybody can do that but many people have that spirit of volunteering now in especially in post modern youth one advantage is that they have a strong activist spirit they want to make some change they want to make a difference in the world so if somehow we can engage that it's wonderful i was in a temple in america and this is like this is a temple of indians but these are indians who had settled in america for a generation almost and their kids had mostly been born and brought up in america so they would sometimes come to the temple out of cultural deference but they didn't seem to have much spiritual interest so then the temple leaders one of the temple leaders got the idea that we want to make our temple eco friendly we want to make our temple green that means have separate uh, separate trash cans for eco recyclable stuff and other things like that so what all can we do for this and now they ask their teenage kids for that you know now being green in today's un- colleges in america is considered a very very cool so then the kids started coming to the temple not because they were interested in hearing the class or they were interested in taking darshan of the deities but they said they we want to make this temple green and they would come regularly set the systems in place and then they presented it as a project in their college and then they had their other students come there they had their faculty come there and they automatically became a host for the temple and when they started explaining the philosophy they started explaining the culture the practices they, they came and they wanted to show primal the the eco friendly project that they had but along with that their 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 other friends and colleagues they were not necessarily indians they were mostly americans and other places they had to explain the other things also so their own connection with their tradition with their temple increased not because they were interested in krishna but because their interest in environmental consciousness was channeled so i would say that we, we that is the expertise of a devotee that not many people will want to elevate their consciousness but if you can help them engage in some seva then their consciousness can be expanded and by that gradually they'll become more receptive to the elevation of consciousness also okay so i'll quickly summarize sabha sachi pro that's okay with you so we discussed three main points today i talked about first is that uh we talked about how the ethos changes according to epoch that in the pre modern times scripture was considered to be the authority in the modern times it is largely pseudo science and post modern it is it is experience and depending on the audience we may have to use either a prescriptive normative or descriptive approach for reaching out to people so that was the first point second point i talked about is the elevation and the expansion of consciousness our purpose is to elevate people but if there is elevation without expansion that can make someone very narrow minded so when there is both then the person not only takes people towards krishna but also has human concern for others and that's what many people are attracted to and their connection i talked about digital and analog spirituality rather than seeing that if I, if somebody has to be krishna conscious they have to do all these things they have to tick all the boxes so whatever boxes they tick that's wonderful so we need to be able to navigate you know, this is more important this is less important and sometimes the less important needs to be subordinated so that the more important can be pursued so thank you very much hare krishna so would any of you like to share some concluding reflections me so sachi prabhu or anybody something that they carried home from this we can take it and in 2 3 minutes and we can finish is that okay I think um because of of the time uh yes, yes. we'll just request that the devotees maybe can text in some of the things I'd like to share the feedback also with you some of the points okay, thank you. and hopefully hopefully we can get another session uh um uh, with you in the coming month to continue I'm happy to be of service for thank yeah. you for this opportunity So thank you so much Chitan Chand Prabhu if you would like to keep up with Chitanjan Prabhu please uh visit his uh, website 
www.gitadaily.com. You can read many wonderful articles that Prabhu writes and publishes every day. He has a website also called thespiritualscientist.com. He also runs a very wonderful podcast on YouTube called The Monks Podcast. Please visit there, subscribe, and uh, take advantage of his association in that way on the web. Uh, we would also like to uh, encourage all of you to kindly follow WUSA on our social media platforms, which include Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Help us to get subscriptions and likes. Uh, our page on YouTube is at WUSA108, on Instagram, same, and also on Facebook. Thank you to those who have subscribed, helping us to reach a broader audience. We'd like to also announce that uh, morning Japa session is going on. Uh, since we were out of electricity, we were on WhatsApp. Starting on Monday, we're back on Zoom. So get the link in the WUSA weekly update group. That group is just for notifications. There won't be any spam, we promise. We would also like to uh, announce that we are getting the book club underway, Books are the Basis Book Club. And there we are studying Shila Prabhupada's books in a very relaxed way and sharing realizations. That will also be announced on the WUSA WhatsApp weekly. We also have a Vaishnavi Sangha, which is called Heart to Heart Vaishnavi Circle. It is every Friday from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. South African time. It is anchored by Her Grace Mother Vrajalila, and it is on Zoom. To find out more, visit www.wusa.online. And also look out on the Wusa Weekly WhatsApp group for announcements. So with that, we will just conclude by saying, visit and book yourself some time to attend some yoga at the Wusa Yoga Studio. It is operational. And uh, please also look out for our wish list on the website and help us to expand our outreach. All of this will be found on www.wusa.online. You can download the wish list there and see how to get involved. So thank you very much to all the devotees for attending and, and a special, special thank you to His Grace Chaitanya Charan Prabhu thank for you. sharing so many gems with us. Keep and we'll keep you informed how to, if, when we do have another session with Prabhu. Yes, Prabhu. Happy to be of service. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai. 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 Gaur Premanandi. Very well. This is a small video to show. I came into Bhakti through my first meditation at uh, BYS, the uh, Bhakti Yoga Society at Vets Campus. And it made such a huge impact because I had never felt as peaceful, as clear-headed, as calm, as sober as I did after that meditation, after chanting the Holy Name for the first time. And it's something that was so impactful for me because it was a real life experience of the spiritual world. It was a real first contact with something beyond the physical, which was something that I was looking for, something that I was searching out for and I hadn't found in my previous religious experiences. So chanting the holy name literally quenched my spiritual thirst. And it's something that I'll never forget and I will always be grateful for. <laughs> Wake up.
Cup South Africa. Woo, Wake up South Africa. You've been sleeping far too long. Wake up South Africa. Now come along and sing this song. Wake up South Africa.